here with actor Connor Jobs, who uh, has been seen here off Broadway in New York in uh, Daniel's Husband and in just wrapped Starcrossed, which yes. played in DC mm -hmm. and was here first at the New York Fringe yes. Festival. Mm -hmm. Before we uh, delve into that, why don't we talk a little bit about when you first decided you wanted to become an actor and did you do that in your native Australia or did you come here to pursue it? Long time ago. I mean, I probably started when I was about 10. Which was like no, yesterday. Like yesterday. <laughs> so it's new to the industry. No, uh, <laughs> so when I was about 10 um, in Australia, yep, as you said. So it was kind of... Uh, I was a, my parents were athletes, were professional athletes, and um, I'm also an athlete and really enjoyed competitive sports and competition, um, but also really loved attention. And my teacher in kind of uh, what you call elementary school really wanted to channel that and mm -hmm. encouraged me to try out for kind of like a youth theatre company type thing. Uh, I did that, loved it. Um, you know, within a year was kind of doing productions in, I mean, it's a lot smaller scale than what you'd see in America, but. Um, you know, professional productions in Australia and um, did Oliver for a very long time, which was which was great. Um, and, you know, worked with, with reps and professional companies in Australia and knew kind of pretty early on that it was going to be my trajectory, I think. Right. Yeah. Did you, um, since your parents are professional athletes and you were also doing yes. athletics, did you want to pursue athletics initially and then bump over to acting once you really fell in love with it? Or? I mean, for a long time, in my early teens, it was, I'm going to do both until mm -hmm. one kind of reveals itself to be more prominent. It was kind of, I was, I was scared, to be honest. I think it was a moment of, I wanted to do both. Mm -hmm. My family definitely expected me, in a way, to kind of, you know, we had the connections in that industry. So, um, you know, knowing how to train me, knowing how to do all those things was a part of my upbringing and playing so many sports. Mm -hmm. I definitely wanted to do both for a long time. Uh, I won't say that it was always act. It was wanted to do both. Yeah. Um, yeah. When did you decide to come here to America? I decided to come to America. I mean, it was here or London. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm from Perth in Australia, which is the west southwest coast. There's not a big professional acting industry. You certainly can't make your only living doing that. And I thought, well, if I have to move to Sydney or Melbourne, I might as well try to go somewhere where I've seen more inspiring theatre. Um, I'd been to uh, London and all over the US on tour and. Uh, with shows from Australia and liked the theatre in both. Loved London theatre a lot and certainly would have gone there if that worked out. But America worked out first and um, it was, so I was about 16 I started thinking about it. I did want to do drama school in Australia and there's probably two big drama schools in Australia. Um, you know, the Hugh Jackmans, the Kate Blanchettes have gone, gone there. Uh, it wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to kind of break free of that and be kind of on my own path. You know, I think you kind of small town syndrome in a little little way, I think. So I wanted to get out of that and decided that America and, and London would be one of the options. So I auditioned for a bunch of schools, got into one here and came when I was 18 right out of high school. Wow. Was there any apprehension or nerves uh, when you were going to yeah. do that? I mean, since you were so young? Yeah, I mean, people ask that a lot. They're like, oh, you came here by yourself at 18 and you didn't know anyone. I'm like, no, <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> but, uh, actually, no. Actually, there wasn't. I think I definitely wanted to get out of... of Perth. I love Perth. It's beautiful, but I really wanted to explore and love traveling. I've traveled my whole life, so I think because I traveled a lot, I've been here a lot. I've been, you know, in Asia and Europe. I think I, it wasn't like I was a fish out of water in a big city at all. It was more so the excitement of meeting new people. I mean, sure, nervous. I think everyone would be nervous. Right, right. But coming to drama school here, I mean, it's a pretty welcoming environment when you're moving here with other people from across the world and across the country. Mm -hmm. I think it's almost the people from America, when they come to college, have a harder time being away from home than the internationals. That's a broad statement, but for me, it, that was my experience. it's probably true, because yeah. mostly the American public don't go away, really, until right. they're in college. So, right. you know, especially for any great amount of time like that. It Was Heath Ledger from Perth? Yes, he was, yeah. yeah my, a friend of mine who was best friends with him, Kane Manera, and he's also from or they thought they were from there. Yep. Was, uh, did you have any acting uh, inspirations when you were back there in Perth that yep. made you really want to jump in and pursue it? I mean, Heath, you mentioned Heath. Is, mm -hmm. For me, I mean, I always say if I ever get the chance to speak in front of a lot of people for my work in terms of an award ceremony or anything like that, Heath is going to be one of the first people I always mention. I mean, he really came from a very similar demographic and wasn't a showboy 
which I think, you know, a lot of people get caught up in, like, show people. And I think Heath was more about the art mm -hmm. than... Say, so I love Hugh Jackman a bit, and he's incredible, but someone like Heath was just so much about the work and mm -hmm. so much about storytelling. I mean, he filmed everything he did. He was yeah. really with his camera. So you see those videos and you just see an artist working behind the eyes all the time. So Heath was certainly... I mean, he's from down the road from where I grew up. His private school was one of the private schools that I played in sport. So, you know, we have a lot of connections there. The State Theatre Centre in Perth is named after him. Mm -hmm. So Heath is certainly one. Um, and I remember seeing, you know, him in small, tiny indie movies and being like, oh my God, yeah. this guy's really incredible. Kind of that sex appeal and charisma that I think is lost a little bit now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you f were fresh out of uh, drama school, mm. did you have a trajectory that you wanted to do primarily? I know you've done primarily theater sure. and some film. Was that your main goal moving forward, or were you going to try and place yourself in TV, film, and theater? Yeah, I mean, certainly big theater background. I've been doing theater professionally since I was kind of like 12 mm -hmm. uh, on big stages in Australia. So definitely have that um, comfortability, I suppose. Yeah. Um, you know, and musical theater is obviously huge in New York. I do that as well. But um, I think it's more the content. People ask me, like, do you want to do TV, film, theater? I mean, I want to do all of it. I do do all of it, but want to get a job yeah. but, uh, <laughs> there's that there's that when do you get hired problem, right? yeah. yes exactly but do you feel more comfortable in one since you've been on stage mm. pretty much your whole life I mean from 12 that's mm. pretty early on mm. do you have the most level of comfort on the stage yeah I think it depends on the production mm -hmm. I mean I think you know I've been singing since that age as well but it's, it's still something that frightens me and I'm I kind of was really afraid about talking about that for a long time mm -hmm. that you know yes I'm a singer but it still really scares me yeah. uh, which is good I think I definitely think you know classical text I love doing in my sleep like mm -hmm. you know that I'm really comfortable doing that and contemporary plays and stuff like that but I mean some musicals frighten me more than others some films depending on how they're shot I mean there's a lot of TV now that is really exposed and raw in terms of very very close to the actor mm -hmm. you know you have to be really good. Um, Euphoria is a show that I'm completely enamoured by right now because the performances are so good. Mm -hmm. um, so doing something like that would be really scary because it's not you can't hide behind production value at, as a, as a point or you know a bad script special or effects, or special anything. effects. Yeah, that kind of thing. So I think I mean definitely really comfortable doing plays. Um, probably have found more comfort since drama school in film and TV. I mm -hmm. think. For me, like I came from a point of a skill set instead of um, maybe a natural relaxed state. Some people come from the other way and have to like gain the skills, I suppose. So for me, it was more about relaxing and more about you know being comfortable and letting the skills go a little bit in a way. Um, but yeah, I think it depends on the project. Now that you have done um, Star Cross in two different areas, yeah. like. It was. It played here, and then you went to Washington. Yeah. Were the audiences similar in terms of the impact it had, or the, mm. or just, for lack of a better word, was there any issues with the PC correctness or, or mm. two men kissing or any, good question like that in in Washington? Yeah, so different. The audience reactions are really. We didn't expect that. I mean, when you go into DC, obviously the different audiences. But I hadn't. I hadn't performed in DC before. Really educated. Mm -hmm. Really, really educated. I mean, we it's also an expanded version of the play that we did last year, so it's been worked on. We've workshopped it a lot, we've done readings, we've worked it. Um, our playwright, so Rachel Garner, is so collaborative that it's been wonderful working with her. I mean, the script has changed a lot, it's expanded, so I think having the DC audience was very valuable for us, but they certainly got all the Shakespearean references. The New York audience has preferred perhaps the more slapstick or comedic um, elements of the show. Uh, it's very funny, so I think they responded to that. Did it affect your performance at all in terms of playing, not that you would totally change the character, but did you mm. kind of enhance your performance in the funnier parts, being in New York, and then kind of modify it when you were there? In I mean, they're both pretty short runs. Mm -hmm. They were informative, but I, th I don't think modify, I think my character's grown. I think mm -hmm. that's credit to the script, the playwright. Also, having now lived with this version of Mercutio for over a year, I've really got to 
live in him and kind of um, explore him more. So I don't think I adjusted for the audience. I think, I mean, the audiences in DC were kind of unpredictable. Mm -hmm. They were smart, but they were also happy to sit and listen quietly. In New York, people are moving, people are laughing loudly because you're taught to better do that in New York. Everyone's mm -hmm. loud here, so um, I don't think that. And also going back to what you mentioned about the reaction to the content, not at all, very overwhelmingly positive, overwhelmingly supportive for the content. Mm -hmm. Um, almost shockingly supportive in a way because you see people from all different demographics young, old, gay, straight mm -hmm. you know, old and particularly DC I mean that audience we had a lot of uh, upper class mm -hmm. people come to the show um, that you know regular theatre goers that's what they do live in Washington DC just go to the theatre and that's their outing and they were overwhelmingly shocked with how much it resonated with them whether they were gay or straight I mean mm -hmm. I think that's why the writing is so good and I'm so lucky to be saying the words it's really thrilling for me but um, no, there's been no kickback on the content which is thank god about time mm -hmm. <laughs> about time when you uh, joined Daniel's husband yeah. had it uh, been announced that it was closing or did you step in for Austin and then like right after it crazy story crazy story so I was opening another play of same writer as Starcross, Rachel Garnett's play Downtown. It was an immersive production um, called Shadow Play, which is about the world of J.M. Barry. I was playing a young Captain Hook mm -hmm. at the time. I was literally doing yoga for opening night. And I got the call from um, Stephanie Clapper Casting saying, you've got Daniel's husband, you start tomorrow, and you'll be on next week. Oh, I'm opening a show in 12 hours. So right. it was kind of, crazy and I had to rehearse in um, Eric Bermudez who played Tybalt in Starcross in the, in the previous two productions. He took over for me as Captain Hook and I rehearsed him in overnight whilst I was rehearsing Daniel's Husband of the Day. Mm -hmm. um, had my first performance on a Thursday, Friday morning, got the call that we were closing. So it was kind of an overwhelming sense of achievement of happiness I mean you know to book a job is amazing in the city mm -hmm. and then to book a show I'd already seen the show mm -hmm. that is so profoundly moving yes it was um, you know it was kind of a dream come true in a way because it was such a gorgeous play and yeah. the talent on that stage was incredible Great. so yes it was sad to find out that you know a day after I started that yeah. in a month's time what I thought was going to be perhaps three months was only a month but in hindsight, it didn't affect my experience, and I, I don't think at the, at the time, a lot of my really close friends that I told before it was announced, it was closing, were like, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, well, but I'm also very lucky, yeah. very lucky to have the job, very lucky to be in this type of production, very lucky to even get to do a month of it. You know, I could have closed that week. Right. That positive attitude and outlook must serve you well in your career as a whole, not just with experiences in theatre. Mm -hmm because if you constantly get down and oh, I'm never gonna book a job or I'm mm -hmm. not good enough looking for this or I'm not talented <laughs> enough for that. Yeah, sure. Like, does that, do you find that helps you keeping upbeat? I mean, I would say I'm more of a realist mm -hmm. than completely uh, upbeat. I think a lot of people around me would say, well, you're not completely upbeat. I, I think I'm more of a realist. Positive maybe? With yeah, positive career. realist. I think I, I kind of, I know how things go in terms of it's not ever personal, it's not ever, going to be like that forever mm -hmm. both positive and negative I mean good things are not going to last forever good good times and bad times and times when you're not booking also is not going to last forever mm -hmm. so I think that mindset more so than overly positive I mean some people work from a euphoric state of positivity and everything's good and I think everything happens for a reason mm -hmm. um, but I certainly work from a, you know knowing that it's things go up and down and I was very fortunate I mean to even have that job so I think it would be remiss of me to be overly upset or not in any situation, I mean, yeah, I didn't really see. I was sad, but uh, I mean, it wasn't an overwhelming negative. There's a lot of productions here now in New York mm. that are filming TV-wise. Mm. Um, is there a show that you would really like to get on that films here in the city? Films, I mean, I love Maisel. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Maisel, fantastic. I think the way they're presenting that content, I mean, Amazon's a great studio and they're really, their writers are really specific. Mm -hmm. um, I like their platform a lot and how they do it. So Maisel is certainly one. Um, I mean, I love LA and I love shooting out there as well. So, I mean, I'd, I'd love to get out there. And as I said, Euphoria is a show that I'm completely overwhelmed with how wonderful it is and relevant it is to young people. Um, because more and more young people are being presented in a certain way now. You know, whether that's 
on Broadway, you know, actual teenagers are getting cast as teenagers now, mm-hmm. um, which is fantastic. As opposed, yeah. Yeah. As opposed to the 90210 crowd that had just reprised their roles and were about the same age when they started. Yeah, it's when they started, exactly. Um, so yeah, I feel like I'm almost in a weird bracket of kind of transition in both the way uh, the casting and what's been written is coming out, but also what I'm, what I'm right for. So, you know, shows like that are exciting where they're kind of presenting people and not jock nerd I mean it's not that anymore which is really exciting for TV there's so much TV now with all the streaming services so certainly shows like Euphoria I mean if, if to go back to the UK Peaky Blinders is one that I've always loved um, you, you mentioned that about not having you know starting to write shows for people and representing people yeah. there aren't just jocks anymore it's not just the nerds oh and, God. The, and the greasers and the whatever like yeah. the world is such a has opened up so much oh, and yeah. created has created opportunities mm-hmm. for people um, to be represented mm-hmm. um, what types of stories would you like to play and do you do anything in terms of your own content that you are trying to get out there yeah 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 I mean you know, people talk about representation a lot in this country. It's fantastic. I mean, you see, finally now, there's this big push for diversity in terms of not only just looks, but in terms of experience. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and people always say to me, what's your opinion on um, telling diverse stories? And I say, well, I can tell you that Australian stories are never told mm-hmm. here, never. Um, and that's something that I tried to avoid for a long time. I kind of pushed away from my identity of being Australian, being an other that isn't considered an other. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, the English, the, the, you know, the main other kind of white population, I suppose, here in actors is a lot of the English actors. Mm-hmm. And I get put in that basket all the time, which is great. I mean, I'm lucky to be put in that basket as well. Right, oh, absolutely. Yeah, but, yeah, but there's also, yeah. you wouldn't think of Australians being a minority that needed to be represented because sure. they think they're, they're right. white, which you are white, but yeah, yeah, yeah. at the same time, you're a separate yeah. entity from just white people. Yeah, and there's just a lot of stereotypes surrounding Australians here. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the same things. Do you have kangaroos in your backyard? Do you eat Vegemite? <laughs> yeah, all those things. You know that I do love Vegemite, but uh, that we get kind of pigeoned into. And a lot of Australian actors are working in the US, and a lot of people don't know they're Australian because they're so uh, wonderful at being American which is great, you have to be able to do that, but um, I've certainly more and more embraced being Australian and wanting to do that content. I've produced um, and a reading of an Australian play here called Flood, we produced that last year, mm-hmm. um, and I directed that as well and had an all-Australian cast and all-Australian production team, and that was thrilling. I mean, thrilling. People say, why do you cast all-Australian? I said, well, we're going to get one thing. <laughs> we're going to get right, one yeah. thing. I'm going to cast Australians in it. And it made such a difference because people came and saw it and they were going, like, the resonance of how the words sounded weren't stereotypical. It wasn't shrimp on the barbie. It wasn't, you know, those things that perhaps people think of Australians because they don't know. It's not taught in schools here. It's not right. on TV. You know, the famous Australians are like the Hugh Jackmans, the Hemsworths, who are mm-hmm. big, but muscular not, men. Yeah, they're not doing... They're not doing Australian work. Not doing Australian work, yeah. Yeah, They're superheroes. Superheroes, yeah. And that's, um, I'm not going to ever be six foot three and the size of Chris Hemsworth, so Mm. I think, (laughs) I'd love to be, but... uh, So would I. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, something that I've been, there's an Australian theatre company in LA, which do great premieres of Australian plays, the transfer plays. Um, There's nothing like that here in the city? No, I'm actually in talks right now to create the first Australian theatre festival in the city. Um which is really exciting. We've started work on that uh, for 2020, for next year. That'd be a really, really cool thing yeah. to be the pioneer behind something like that. Yeah, yeah, and having produced before, it's something that I feel, I know a lot of Australians in the city, it's kind of one thing I keep a tab on. Mm-hmm. It's kind of whenever I meet an Australian artist, in any capacity, not just actors, I kind of note it down, and I've got kind of like a database of Australians now that I love mm-hmm. working with, because there's just, we jump at the chance to work at work on anything, mm-hmm. let alone our own text. So. There's so many good Australian playwrights and film film writers, and there's a lot. In Starcross, do you hide your accent, or...? Uh, Mikisho you... is English. He's English, and that was a decision we made before we even started the first production. I read the script, uh, Rachel sent me the script when I was auditioning, uh, and I said, he's not American. Uh, and that's not a personal thing. I was reading it, and the way he kind of handles language, being put as the outsider, being not of House Montague, not of House Capulet, 
you know, as, as a friend of the house, it's this joker and not quite taken seriously. I, and the way he has a command on language didn't strike me as an American. So um, I kind of, when people say, oh, who do, who's your role inspired by uh, kind of the Jude Laws, you know, the, um, those, kind of, those kind of actors that very suave, hidden men in, in the way they kind of present themselves mm -hmm. behind their words. So that was the decision to go English for Mercutio and the others are American. What did you find most challenging about playing Mercutio and the show in general? Mm, it's a very challenging show. I mean, I think he has so much sadness behind, he plays this game, you know, he speaks about life as a game, fair kitten, saying to Tybalt. And it's, there's so much going on behind. And I totally relate to that. I certainly, certainly turn on in mm -hmm. social situations and have only recently been like, well, it's actually okay to let emotion come through sometimes in your yeah. personal life. And Mercutio is like that. And the ex expanded text now allows for that. Did doing the play help you with that? Since you said it was certainly, just recently, yeah. Certainly, personally helped me. Um, and it's not therapy, but it, it certainly helped me discover things about myself, which has given a, a larger breadth to the role. Mm -hmm. um, but probably the hardest thing about the play is just, it's a beast. I mean, it's, it's 100 minutes straight through in almost every scene, there's only three of us, very wordy, very wordy, um, and they go from regular day life to falling into love to, I mean, it's not a spoiler because it's yeah, Romeo and Juliet, pretty, they, die. Say, pretty, they die, they yeah. die. Uh, spoiler alert yeah, from sorry. the 1500s or when, exactly. whenever it was written. <laughs> um, so I think the challenge is going on that journey is it takes a lot of energy. I mean, it's not a show we get to sit off backstage and wait for a song to be sung or the 11 o'clock number. It's not that. Yeah, there's not. <laughs> it doesn't seem like it'd be very, uh, very much in that vein at all. <laughs> no, but I mean, I certainly, I'm very lucky to have worked with um, the actors and, and, and people in the room, the creatives, because it's a very, very safe and collaborative space. Mm -hmm. It's a very sensitive topic. It's, I think one thing we said from day one is we have to get it right because... Mm -hmm. We don't want to get this content wrong. We don't want to misrepresent, and we don't want to be another Shakespeare adaptation because it's really not. And you know, we, you see the reaction we've had. It's people are going, "Well, it's not just another Romeo and Juliet adaptation," which is high praise for Miss Garnet, our writer. Yeah, and and for you guys as well. Sure, I mean, yeah. The the play is as good as the words, but mm -hmm. the actors are bringing the words to life. Yeah, and the words are bringing the actors to life. Yeah, so and they're also when it's a collaboration that clicks. It's, when it clicks, exactly, it's and I think amazing. also making it understandable to modern day audiences. I mean, Shakespeare has definitely suffered in this country, at least from my experience in the last kind of five years. I mean, productions that have gone to Broadway haven't been received as as well. When there is good work going on there, it's just not understood in a way or presented in a way that's perhaps too obvious. And Rachel's was so good with the language that it's allowed audiences. I mean, the example that I've been using is my dad. I've done a lot of Shakespeare, love Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And he came and saw a double bill that I did of Midsummer Night's Dream and As You Like It. And he fell asleep. And he said, oh, I woke up when someone laughed in, in the second act and blah, blah, blah. He loves Starcrossed. He was absolutely enamored by it. He understood every word. And mm -hmm. it's still in verse. It's still there's still original Shakespeare text in there and people understanding it completely clearly uh, and in a non-generic way. So that's been a big takeaway for us. I mm -hmm. think exciting that we can bring classical content with modern day relevance without it being set in the future or you know set in a certain uh, political realm as they like to do in, in other Shakespeare productions. Yeah, which <laughs> there's enough politics Correct. outside of. Correct. Uh, Too outside much. of theatre, like you're supposed to go to the theatre to. Yes. Yes, you are supposed to think. It is supposed to make you think and possibly mm -hmm. change an opinion. But at the same time, sometimes you just want to go be entertained as well. Yes, yeah, so we don't want to be thinking about the political circumstances that not only this country, but a lot of other countries yeah, is not, going through right now. So. Absolutely. Uh, and Starcross is going to continue, correct? It is going to continue. We're very excited. I mean, it's. Um, can't say a lot about where it's going or anything, but it is going to continue. Uh, we'll be back in the city sometime next year. That's awesome. Yeah, so we're very excited to bring it back to, for a longer, a real run, a real, mm -hmm. um, a real run and where we get to explore the characters for longer than, you know, the kind of truncated performances we've had as of yet. Now will the other two gentlemen also be in it? We don't, I mean, we don't, we don't know at this stage. I mean, it's kind of, we've got a very positive response from... But I mean, you were attached to it. Uh, yes, uh, yes. You I better be, right? I hope so, I hope so. <laughs> Unless it's something I don't know. Uh, <laughs> 
She's oh. my third. She's my next interview. Yeah, she's, she's the, the replacement. She's going to come and do the game. <laughs> um, <laughs> she's bringing your replacement. My replacement's coming. Double good. interview. Well, tell them I say hi. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> obviously, the scheduling um, things that have to go into place. True. And so it's, yeah. it's, it's always logistics, always. I mean, even from the reading we had earlier this year in the city to DC, things changed because of scheduling. And um, I mean, whoever's attached to this production, it's people that are very passionate about it. Which, well, saying that, what if you did book a role where you were not able to uh, partake in this next iteration of it? Yeah. Would, would that actually be hard, not hard to watch somebody else take it mm. another step forward? Or would you actually turn down work so you could be part of it? It would have to be a very good role to be turning away this, this role. I mean, having been with it from the start, mm -hmm. it's pretty rare you get to be a part of a production right from the ground, mm -hmm. ground up. and. When it's one that you're really passionate about, I kind of said, this will be the one that I'm going to pull my ace out for and do everything I can to stay with it and make it go forward. So it would have to be something very, very good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at this stage, I would love to stay with Starcrossed as long as the creators will have me. Mm -hmm. And But also, it, the production's bigger than me, and that's it's always the case. Everyone it, you know, is replaceable in a way, and I would also love to see someone doing a few shows. I'm sure it'd be completely different. Um, we didn't have an understudy on this production, but last year we did. Um, Does that put an added pressure on you, knowing that like you have to be there every night, even if you feel like shit, you have to? No, I, I mean, I, I, I've never considered really calling out, or I mean, it's obviously in musicals, theatre in in this city and, and Broadway, it's a fact, and you know, the performers know that, mm -hmm. the audience know that, so it's kind of it's not expected, but. It's okay, I, and it doesn't happen as much with plays. You know, in plays you don't really call out. I think in Daniel's Husband, none of the boys called out for the whole run. So, you know, that's over a hundred shows in yeah. a row. Uh, and yeah. Very heavy subject matter. Heavy. Very heavy subject matter. Not and a lot surprisingly of surprisingly heavy subject matter that you don't see coming. I know. Yeah, truly. Um, you know, having to because I came in as an understudy in that production, I watched it. I mean, twenty times, twenty plus times before I went on, and. Um, gutted every time I mean, it's really it was a lot a lot but I mean I think I don't think anyone would say they they wouldn't learn something from seeing someone else mm -hmm. read their words yeah you also do uh, directing on your own as well and, and working with others has being an actor helped with that so you can see their point of view when maybe you have an idea and they're kind of not the pushback but challenging right. you a little bit on you know well I think as a performer this is how I would like to do it do yeah you have to kind of like balance the line I think the, uh, the biggest thing I've learned from doing it's more I think directing's helped me with my acting more mm -hmm. instead of the other way around um, just learning how to collaborate I think it's not about being a good actor or being a good director it's being a good collaborationist and being being able to if you're a director run a room and be an actor understand how the room is run mm -hmm. And the best directors I've worked with are all collaborationists and are all willing to talk and have conversations. And it's, it's you know, I don't think there's such a thing as a bad director. I think it's about learning how to work with different directors. And I've had that everyone's so different. Yeah. You know, particularly that here, there's directors that have trained at uh, grad schools. You know, Columbia is obviously pretty prominent in the city. Yale School of Drama. These, you see these directors and they come in with a certain approach, which is fantastic and nice because it's a structure. Mm -hmm. And then there's other directors that are not from that background and, and direct from a place of experience and emotion and then there's both so I think it's more about understanding how to adapt mm -hmm. to different directors and it's, it's a thrill because you go into a room and it's not going to be run the same way you might block a show in a week and then run it for three mm -hmm. and explore the character that way or you might block it really slowly and go through detail this production of Starcross we did detail oriented rehearsal process so we did every scene till it was baked and then, you know, I always talk about baking the cake is how I kind of think about it and don't overcook the cake. So mm -hmm. we kind of did the scene really, you know, five hours on a scene, put it to bed next. And then we only ran the show a day before we opened. So that, wow, that, was, that had to be yes, exciting, but yet terrifying. Terrifying, yeah. terrifying, especially when, you know, we're going into a space, DC, with very little time to adapt to the space and, you know, the ins and outs of the venue and, and the backstage and all that. So... It was a thrill though, because you get out there and, and then the world is in your hands and the, the words are in your hands and you kind of go, oh, well actually it's in my control. Mm -hmm. But it was terrifying, oh boy, it was stressful. <laughs> you mentioned uh, a desire to create your own work. Do you think you could 
creative director can star in it, or is that just way too many hats? Mm. Or, and does it feel like you would have just too much control over it? Like, yeah. I think, I mean, I've written pieces before that I've, I've written for myself as an actor. I think if I was going to write and be in it, I wouldn't direct it. It would have, I mean, I think an outside eye is always valuable. Mm. And I understand there are some people that are very, very good at having written, directed and starred. But I think there's something to be gained from having someone else there. So I, I mean, there's certain people I would trust with that content, mm -hmm. as any artist that's writing their own work would be. But every process is better when you detach and give it to someone else to manipulate. So I, I don't think I'd ever do all three, no matter how much money would be put behind it. I would certainly direct and, and act, perhaps, which I've done before, which brings its own complications. And you certainly have to have someone you know, assistant or an associate that mm -hmm. you really trust, that you can at one point switch off one brain and just be in the other. Uh, but I definitely think writing and, and being in it is something that I will do and have done and will do again. Mm -hmm. I'm writing a new piece right now, actually, as we speak, um, just about the immigration process here for performance, because it's very unique, um, that I would certainly want to be in myself. With, yeah, with working with pieces and stuff, mm -hmm. yeah. Which is... But kind of, although it's a massive part of our lives for, for us that are here, having to have been here from earning our way here and from having to do those things to work towards permanent residency, um, that we have to be quiet about because there's a fear behind it because of a lack of understanding. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's why I want to perform in that one, but I would definitely, I, I, I know who would, I'd want to direct it, but it wouldn't be me. Interesting. Uh, what do you got going on this summer? Are you just taking it easy? Are you gonna? Yeah, I mean, Starcross was a complete whirlwind. I mean, was we came back in February after doing last year, and we did a reading, changed the script, mm -hmm. changed the script again, workshopped it, and then took it to DC. And I did another production in the city of an Australian play, which was really, really. I didn't speak; I was a mute, but I, I got to do an Australian <laughs> play. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in between there as well. Um, but now, uh, just switching my focus a little bit for the to film for a little bit, um, kind of shooting some short stuff for my own content and um, writing, writing a lot, which is good. Did you find playing a mute more challenging than playing somebody with lines? Uh, for a multitude of reasons? Incredibly informative. Yeah. Incredibly informative. I mean, you have to be so switched on. You know, I think, particularly being an actor that works with a lot of words a lot of the time, you almost find rhythms that you, you know, you're taught to break and you don't want to fall into, but playing, I mean, he was a mute um, from abuse. So it's the place called Holy Days by Andrew Ravel. It's incredible. He wrote When the Rain Stops Falling, which came to New York. He's a really prominent, wonderful playwright. He wrote this character very much in the center of this play. And it's, you know, you see mutes usually kind of on the outskirts of a play because how much can you basically play on a mute? Right, and, it, right. and it wasn't based on him, but he was certainly the one that was in the center of all the horrible things happening mm -hmm. in this colonial Australia setting. Um, because all eyes, are on you because you're not saying something in a way. Um, incredibly challenging. It was also a play that I had to get beaten on stage, um, sexually abused on stage every night. So it was challenging because of that, because words are an outlet for emotion. So mm -hmm. when it's all sitting behind a lack of ability to talk, mm -hmm. uh, I certainly I went into the project knowing it was gonna be very challenging. It affected me 10 times more than I thought it would. Do you feel with a character like that uh, and what happened to him on stage that you just described, do you feel you have to almost take yourself out of it? Like, what if it triggers somebody in the audience if that happened? Like, do you feel there's a responsibility on your part to not take it too far, but yet convey what mm. has gone on because you're playing a character that happened to? Yeah. So it's kind of like a delicate tight walk, rope walk. We had a lot of people react mm -hmm. very strongly. I mean, it's not a contemporary setting, mm -hmm. but people were, we had, a, few people walk out in certain scenes in the play I mean they were incredibly graphic and our directors from day one were saying we're not doing this play if it's not going to be what it was because it wasn't pretty it wasn't mm -hmm. censored it wasn't with anything else than brutal assumptions and there was no fear of getting caught so from these people so I had felt a huge responsibility you know particularly now where there's so much more awareness around abuse and mistreatment of of youth mistreatment of of women in, in even our NI industry, my industry, and I felt a massive um, responsibility there. Um, not only to, to do it justice, but also to not, as you said, kind of overblow it, because 
you know, you see sometimes how they used to be portrayed as perhaps melodramatic because it's cinema or because it's the art theatre, but in this setting, it's about survival. It's not about the drama of screaming, and mm-hmm. I mean, it's about survival and not dying, not dying. And um, being, oh, he was sixteen, the character, and the man that was abusing him was in his thirties, powerful, and, and the actor, Shane McNaughton, he massive actor so for me it was not easy to to understand in a way um, but it was certainly very real in terms of what was going on and did that scare you when you first took the part it did I mean there's a lot of fight choreography and um, intimacy uh, well you know or yeah. lack of intimacy, no I know, right? you know, yeah, what I know exactly yeah. what you're saying uh, that had to go into the rehearsal process it was a very delicate rehearsal process there was nudity involved it was the first time I've done that to that extent as well and um, very challenging rehearsal process because when you're doing it in a rehearsal room with lights on with stopping and starting and I kind of said to the directors at one point I was like if, if we're going to run this can we just do it the whole way through right because it's affecting your performance because I, I can't just stop and start and that, I didn't want to be dramatic about it but I was saying like I think I was like we can put a pin in that and we'll do it we'll piece it together but I don't want to um bake the cake too early or, or push for a result when it's dealing with that sensitive topic. Mm. Um, I think we got it pretty right. I mean, it's a dangerous situation. I mean, the fight, when you're fighting and there was um, water, it's based around a creek, there was water involved and, you know, so there was dangers in terms of slipping, in terms of being, you know, undressed, being all of that. So it was certainly, we were very careful and cautious about that from the start. Um, and it was only when you're kind of in it having the moment on stage and then that moment ends and you hear the audience having a very very physical and verbal reaction mm-hmm. and at the end of the play kind of people just stunned by what they'd seen that it, it kind of really set in then for me how it was does that scene happen towards the end there's multiple but i mean oh, it, um okay. the, the the big scene the unraveling of it all happens probably three quarters of the way through um and then he doesn't get out and it, it suggested that it will continue. Did playing such a heavy part start to affect you uh, mentally in your own life, or did you just leave it on the stage? I would love to say it didn't, but it, it did. Yeah. Uh, I, I've never really, I said this to a lot of people at the time, I really went in, perhaps uh, naively, thinking that it wouldn't. Mm-hmm. That it would, um, you know, very heavy content. I've always been pretty good at switching off. I certainly don't subscribe to the idea of complete method acting. I think it's unhealthy, mm-hmm. um, particularly from people that I've looked up to that it's affected them horribly um but it did it did i mean i I never have to i've never had to think about decompression time after a show it's the first time i had to do that it's the first time i had to not be out and like see people in the in the lobby and Mm -hmm. be happy and see friends and I, i i didn't go out for drinks after i didn't celebrate the show at the time because it didn't feel appropriate but it certainly took a lot to come down from that show. And it was also, <laughs> it was the winter in New York and it was, you know, we're in a downtown theater and I think it all contributed to that feeling mm-hmm. of, you know, we're doing this kind of rough, rough stuff. And um, it's not with anything other than presenting the art, you know, it certainly wasn't a Broadway production or anything like that, so. And for those people that stuck it out, they got to see mm. theater that left them speeches. Yeah, I remember I mean, seeing Normal Heart when it was off Broadway. Sure. And sure. my friend and I like we would do the stage door thing normally, mm. read the actors tell them how much we enjoyed their performance. And that night we we, we didn't even speak to each other. Yeah. It didn't come up. All we did was like walk out like zombies like the rest of the people. Yeah. And that's really a testament to the actors, to the writing, to everything coming together. Mm-hmm. And you know, it sounds like your experience was the same. Yeah, and I think a lot of theater now is uh, it's reactionary to the times we're in. So there's a lot of theatre about hope and about the, the way we want the world to be and happiness and, and, and inclusivity. So there's kind of been a little bit of a push from to push away from that kind of no no um, happy endings. Mm-hmm. So to do a play that didn't have a reprieve at all wasn't funny throughout the play. It was pretty brutal the whole way through. Um, definitely was seemed like a new experience for a lot of audience members that have perhaps only been seeing theatre here mm-hmm. for the last, well, influenced by the last few years. And unfortunately, it's a sad reality that mm-hmm. that does in fact happen. Yeah, yeah. And it may start a conversation, which yeah. is desperately needed. Mm-hmm. And it, it also started a conversation about the Indigenous population in Australia. I mean, the play deals with that. 
and who's writing these stories and, and Andrew was nice enough to come and do a talk back and he spoke about how now he wouldn't write another play about this because it's not his story to tell anyone. you know and it, this was a colonial story it wasn't a story about race in Australia race issues in Australia were involved mm -hmm. and they will always be involved with any story about our country because of the deep 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 oppression that happened and um, horrible things that happened so but it you know brought up that conversation about how they're represented how mm -hmm. indigenous indigenous Australian population are presented um, and we're very very lucky to have um, an indigenous actress fly from Australia to be a part of the production which mm -hmm. was uh, the reason I signed on I, I got the offer and said who was playing this role it shouldn't be anyone other than an indigenous Australian because that wouldn't be right for me. And, and that show is doing exactly, or did, and, and if it comes back, would do the same thing. Like, I had no idea five minutes ago that that was such an issue in Australia. Sure. And that's why no, it's it so important to have Australian theatre and whatever yeah. country's theatre, because yeah. people are just, oh, it's this over here. It's oh, so nice over there. Australia is beautiful. Well, right. So is the United States beautiful, and there's a lot of shit that goes on that's not so beautiful right, right. that yeah. that needs to be you know to be seen to for people to fully grasp what actually it's mm -hmm. like to be in somebody else's shoes. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, there's a lot of issues in Australia. The classic Australian thing is to not talk about it, mm -hmm. to not talk about it, and um, with emotions. With I mean, young men have a lot of issues in Australia with anger, with um, not being able to express themselves. Mm -hmm. Certainly battled with that myself, and. Um, the race issue in Australia is presented in a very different way to here. Yeah, because who you, I would never have known there's a race issue in Australia. Mm. And Huge. probably I would say if you ask 100 people on the street, probably all, 97 all the of them would say yeah. that they didn't know. Yeah, and the representation of those actors and their stories, and I mean, it's incredible the perseverance and strength mm. that the Aboriginal community has shown in Australia. Um, and Shanoa, the actress that came across from Australia, was so unbelievably welcoming to her story mm -hmm. and sharing that with the cast and creative which must have been incredibly difficult for her and also to trust us having not met any of us she flew here mm -hmm. started rehearsal the next day and um, you know also playing a role that was um, abused mm -hmm. in the show uh, put under slave conditions um, in a different way that, to how the, it happened here but incredibly difficult for her so to have that really brought it home for me so mm -hmm. I think to bring light to those issues and to issues of abuse and um, mistreatment and being in a place where there's not an outlet that we have now of communication or saying something mm -hmm. that is finally being encouraged um, obviously you know the Me Too movement the diversity mm -hmm. push that it's fantastic that's starting to happen there's still so much work to do as well so well I, I really appreciate the gift that you put forth in your performance and caring enough to actually yes. to do a, a you know phenomenal job and like mm. really be embodying the character. I thank you so much for stopping by, Connor. It yeah, was a thank you. Real pleasure to interview you. Yeah, thanks so much. I look forward to another one when uh, Starcross comes back. Yes, yes, come see it. I, oh, I'll be there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks, Connor.